welcome everyone. Um, the SES acknowledges traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and communities. We acknowledge the first peoples of the River Murray areas as custodians of the regions and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living River Murray people today. We pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and to Elders past and present. A little bit of housekeeping um, for those who aren't local. The toilets are out through the door to the left and the emergency exits are here and out to the side. So. The South Australian State Emergency Service is a volunteer-based emergency assistance and rescue service. We provide emergency assistance to the people of South Australia 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We respond to thousands of calls for assistance from the South Australian community each year. We respond to extreme weather events such as floods, storms and heat waves, road crashes, marine, swift water, vertical and confined space rescues. We often assist other agencies such as South Australian Police and the Country Fire Service. Today we have about 1,600... <laughs> Today we have about uh, 1,600 volunteers based in 73 units across South Australia. Our volunteers are supported by a team of full-time staff. My name is Fiona Madigan and I have Mel Crossing. We're both volunteers with the State Emergency Service. I'd like to thank the people who helped to put this meeting to get together, including the council. This is an information meeting. You'll hear lots of information, and most of it's on fact sheets. We have fact sheets down the side of here and some maps also. Um, so don't worry about jotting down phone numbers and websites, for example. Everything's available on fact sheets. We're live streaming this event, and the event will be saved and will go up on the SASES website after. So, if you want to, if you miss something, want to go back and have a look, they're available. All the meetings are on the SASES website. We've got several guest speakers who are going to talk to you about what they are doing. We're all doing our best here, and we're all, are all and please be respectful of those people here and others. Tonight, today we have the we have Ian from the SES. We have. Joe from the Department for Environment and Water. We have Ben from the Mid Murray Council. We have Tony from the Infrastructure and Transport. Uh, primary Industries and Region South Australia is Barb. And we have SAPN or Power Networks Paul Irwin. So, what I'll do, I'll just start off with the first speaker who is in from the SES. Thanks, Ian. Thank you, Fiona. Welcome, everybody. Glad to see so many faces here uh, to the community meeting, and hopefully uh, you will get some information from our speakers up here today. Um, as Fiona has mentioned, the purpose of the meeting is to provide the community with timely, tailored and relevant information to this incident. So we call this uh, River Murray uh, flooding and incident in SES terms, um, identify the risks of the community that may have been overlooked and to provide an opportunity for the community and stakeholder feedback. Um, probably the most important website that you can go to is the .sa.gov.au website. That is the one where all of the agencies are formulating all of the information, so it's a one-stop shop. Okay, so that's the most important one. If you take anything away, sa.gov.au website. Um, so a little bit of background today. Currently we've had about 1,100 um, properties impacted by the flooding um, and we're up to about 90 road closures throughout and around the River Murray. So that's very significant and we appreciate that it's putting a large impact on the community as far as travel. Um, the Department of Infrastructure and Transport won't be closing 
roads or the council closing roads unless it's absolutely necessary. So, um, you know, we're not just doing it to upset people. There are reasons for it, and I'm sure they'll be spoken about later. These are probably the highest flows since the 1970s. Um, I won't say many. I might say some of you may have been around uh, for those for those flows back then and you will probably find that even though we say these flows are similar to the 1970, they may not be exactly the same because things change over all of these years. So where it impacted back in the 1970s may not exactly be impacting now or vice versa. So because it's an ever-changing system, we just need to be aware of that, that everything's not going to be exactly the same. Um, today we just want to talk to you about what is currently happening, what's forecast to happen, and what you can do to help protect yourself and your property. We do acknowledge that the shack um, areas downstream of Cadill have experienced impacts from the flooding um, since early November. So this is how long it has been going and probably even a little bit longer than that as well. So this is, as you know, not something that's happened overnight. This has been ever evolving and the agencies here and the services have been doing everything they can to try and do that pre-planning. However, Mother Nature she changes her mind all the time, so it's very difficult to predict what is going to happen. However, the agencies are doing the best they can. Um, as you probably know, the Morgan Ferry closed on the 6th of December. Um, the Morgan Cadell Road and High Street Roads are likely to become inaccessible sometime um, either later this week, uh, next week. And the Morgan Riverfront precinct, the lower section is beginning to inundate. This is all something that you residents already know. Um, I am going to let the um, uh, speaker from Department of Environment and Water will talk to you about the forecast flow rates and heights and that type of information, okay? They're the specialists, we'll let them talk about that. So what's the SES doing? Um, we've established an incident management team in Loxton and they're in control of the, the situation. SES is the control agency for flooding. So we've put an incident management team at Loxton to continue to plan for the increase of flows. Uh, and as it increases, the team is increasing as well. Um, and we are starting to split up into divisions and sectors of the river so we can start controlling different areas of the river as that water comes down. A zone emergency uh, support team has been established and that been running since August this year. And they continue to meet twice a week. So that's including collaboration and coordination between the agencies and councils as well. So there is communication going on consistently with all of the involved stakeholders. And the State Emergency Centre is being briefed twice a week. Uh, all agencies across the government sector meet under the... Under the um, uh, leadership of the police commissioner or their nominated um, coordinator to continue to coordinate a response to the communities. So that's high level officials of the government getting together twice a week to communicate with each other and keep each other briefed. SES has been working with those stakeholders, so the councils, Department of uh, Infrastructure and Technology, DW, SA Water, um, those likes, and the local community groups, like we're doing now, uh, to understand the risk and the impacts and identify those mitigation procedures that we can implement as well. There is a levy working group 
um, and they're looking at the issues upstream with the levy bank failures that have been happening and not only just the breaches but some of the the issues that have been risen by that and that will be spoken about a little bit later. Um, they're working along with, with the councils on strategic levy, levy rehabilitation and monitoring. So we are having some levy assessment teams that are going to start working. In fact, today we've got two teams going out just checking those levies. Technical swift water teams are being placed along the river to ensure that if there is any issues that require life assistance, then we've got teams up here all ready to go, so we can get straight into it rather than having to bring teams up from, from Adelaide. So you will see some people walking around in wetsuits. Um, they are there for the community safety. Um, more than not saving the community, we'll be using them to do other little tasks as well. We have a marine safety group that's to increase the focus of safety messaging for people along the river and people that are using the river and about safety on the river as well. You all know that when the river rises, things submerge that you can't see um, and there are hazards. You may all know that. Unfortunately, some of the people coming up from uh, away from the river might not know that. So we're continually putting out messaging around in-water safety. You would see the defence cell locations um, have been identified and defence cell, the mobile uh, levies, are being deployed in certain locations in consultation with the stakeholders that are requesting them. So SES is actually supplying them and putting them up at the request of the, uh, the council or the agency. A couple of weeks ago, um, there was an emergency alert sent out to strategic places along the river, all the way from the border, all the way down to the lower lakes. That was coordinated by SAPOL, um, and CFS, MFS and PERSA were involved in doing a door knock to those strategic locations. The aim of that was to communicate flood risk and to confirm with the householder their plans. And we wanted to try and get information from them as in how many people were living at the resident, phone number so we can contact, and if they were planning to stay or if they'd had plans to go. So we were trying to get information so if at any time that risk arose unexpectedly or anything like that, we had information where we could contact them and ensure that they were still safe. That was the whole idea of that door knocking and to do that the best way was to put out the emergency alert. You may have found that some were not contacted. That's because they were deemed to be outside of the flood plain, the mapping. All right. If some of you were not contacted, then it may have been because you were missed because you were not at home at the time and information should have been left for you to be able to go online and fill out a survey. All right. If anyone believes that they weren't, then um, we can talk about that after the meeting. All right. But I'd like to see your concerns and we can look at mapping to see whether you're actually supposed to be involved or not. Um, and finally, the emergency relief centres, they've been opened in Berry uh, and Manham. So as I said, for public information, we spoke about that emergency alert that came out. We've got some watch and act messaging out at the moment as well. Two of those are out, one for the lower River Murray and one for the upper River Murray. So it's a continual... Um, flood watch and act that we're putting out just as an information for the people that are in and around the Upper and Lower Murray. Information and websites, there is a whole heap of them. As I said, 
Number one is sa.gov.au. That will have all the information that you require. There's a flood and storm information line that will have information for over there. That's a, a phone number, a 1800 phone number. You can also um, go to the SES website, so ses.sa.gov.au. Again, there'll be information about that. Um, that gives you um, all information about flood, what you can do about flood, and also uh, the alerts and warnings that are out as well. SES has a social media um, pages that you can follow. There's local social needs um, groups and council websites, and I believe there's also a, a Progress or a Shack Owners Association as well. So there are plenty of places out there that you can get your information. However, I do suggest that you continue to watch the sa.gov.au because that is where the information is all from. All right, so you, uh, and you can't get, you can't use your phone and everything like that. All right. Well, all right. Thank you. We'll we'll come to that after then. I'll I'll come and see you and see if there's anything that can be done. So we'll move on. Yeah. Um, so there's also um, six strategic locations that have been established for sandbags. So Blanche Town, Bow Hill. Glossop, Manham, Murray Bridge and Pringa Town. So they're available between 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock in the afternoon and they're manned um, seven days a week. You can go and get your sandbags there. However, I do suggest we, we are saying that you can get you know, up to 100 sandbags. We have noticed that there are some properties that are continually coming back, getting more and more sandbags. And we suggest if that's the case, you need to speak to those people, those SES members on site. Because we're suggesting that up to 20 would probably be all you need if you're going to have a small inundation. So around the doors, around the vents in your, in your walls, um, and possibly you know, in, your, in your toilet to stop any water coming up. If you're looking at getting any more than that, if you think you're going to sandbag your whole house, then it's probably not appropriate. Okay? So have a talk with the people there at the sandbag site, explain your situation, and they will be able to help you. Um, So the, the nearest locations to yourself here, Blanchetown and Glossop. So at the Blanchetown Sports Club and the Glossop, uh, the former high school. So they're the, they're the two closest locations for yourselves. But please talk to the um, people there. Um, I know I'm getting a, probably a bit of a wind-up from our facilitator down here. So what can you do as residents? Um, Firstly, you need to acknowledge that many of the towns and shacks around the area and around Morgan are beginning to see impacts and there will be impacts. So since October, November, you would have seen that. Um, be aware of your own flood risk. Um, a good website, and I apologise, but this is going to go again, uh, the DEW, the Water Connect website, is a good website to go to, to keep up to date with what's happening. Um, as I said, sandbag your doors, your vents, your drains, um, put one down in your toilet so the, the dirty yucky water doesn't uh, come back up. Um, as much as possible, lift objects off the ground, so get those um, lounges and bookcases. I've been to lots of floodings where people have got all their photos stored in the bottom shelf of the bookcase and once the water subsided they have swollen and they're ruined and you can't get them out of the bookcase you've got to bust the bookcase open to get them out so please try and get things up as high as possible
Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I understand what you're saying. However, you know, we've been trying to work through these places um, and the, the, along with the community members, um, we've been trying to get these set in place. Um, it's not going to be perfect every single time, you know. I know you think that, yeah, we can start at Renmark and just work our way down, but unfortunately getting venues, getting um, organisation has been a lot more difficult than, than what we think. So um, we, we apologise if you think that we've been too late. However, you know, we have tried to get here um, in, in time. Okay. Um, we'll also... Uh, need to ensure that if you are on the water, you obey the speed limits that have been put in place. Now, if you have a place on the, on the edge there and you've got boats running up and down at speed, you know that that produces waves, you will get upset with that. So if you are on the water, please be mindful of that as well. Um, we are trying to monitor those speeds, but you know we can't be everywhere at all at once. So um, we're trying to look after that as much as possible. Um, be aware of those road closures and waters over the road. Uh, be careful when you're using generators, especially uh, fuel generators in enclosed spaces. And the big thing that I want to talk about, don't drive, walk or play in those flood waters because you just do not know what's under that dirty water. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave it there at the moment um, and I'll pass over to Fiona to move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Before I introduce the next speaker, what we'll do, we'll ask you if you can hold your, question, hold your questions until the end because they may get answered by our subsequent speakers. So at the end, there'll be a forum in which you can answer any questions. So, and we also, we may not better answer all your questions, but there is some post-it notes at the back of the table, on the table at the back of the door where you can write things down and things will get posted onto websites. So, um, Tony. Actually, sorry, I've gone the wrong, done the wrong one. Sorry, Joe from Environment and Water. Thanks, Joe. Good morning. My name is Joe Rex. I work for the Department for Environment and Water. I'm a senior operations officer, um, and I'm here to talk to you about the flow forecast. Um, I'll talk to you about a couple of things. So I want to talk to you about the current conditions and what we're seeing. Uh, what is forecast, um, our most recent observations from the week past and, and what we're doing. Um, but before I do start, I just would like to talk to you about where this information can be found. Um, understanding that some of you no longer have access to internet and power, um, this information is all available on the website, um, but we issue a weekly flow report from the Department for Environment and Water. If you're subscribed in your email, you receive it. Um, however, what we might need to start doing is bringing hard copies to these meetings so that if you aren't able to access it online, you're able to take a copy um, with you. It contains lots of information, uh, river, de uh, river heights, um, flow forecast information, um, and just more inf just helpful information to understand the situation as it's progressing and moving along the river. Thankfully, a second week of dry conditions has now been experienced across the Murray-Darling Basin, helping to settle catchment conditions. 25 to 50 millimetres of rainfall has been forecast for the coming week at the top of the Murray catchment. We don't anticipate that this will contribute to the peak flow when it crosses the South Australian border later this month. Current conditions. At the moment, the peak is at Euston in New South Wales. Flow over the South Australian border today is at around 180 gigalitres a day. At Overland Corner, this is 143 gigalitres a day. At Lock 1, 125 gigalitres a day. We anticipate this to increase to 140 gigalitres a day by next Friday. Our lake levels at Alexandrina are 0.83 metres and at Albert are 0.79. It is expected that barrage operations will be able to safely pass the forecast flood peak and maintain water levels in the lower lakes below one metre. The barrages, all 590 gates, are now open 
and are able to release as much water as possible. Because of the water that's been passing through the barrages and out through the lakes, we are now starting to see a good amount of scour at the Murray mouth, which will provide for us a greater ability to push more water out if and when we need to. So the peak. It is forecast that the flow that the total flow at the South Australian border will reach a peak in the range of 190 to 220 gigalitres a day in the last week of December. You may have heard previously or read in the flow reports that we were talking about um, low, moderate and high um, probabilities of where the peak would get to and when it would arrive. As the water has moved down the river, we've been able to get a better understanding of what volume will come over the border and when it will arrive. As the water continues to move down through South Australia, we'll be able to refine our predictions and our forecasts and get better. But at the moment, what you'll be seeing now is one range for one peak. This flow is then expected to reach Morgan at around the 4th and 15th, so between the 4th and 15th of January, with a corresponding water level of between 9.2 and 9.5 metres. And at Manham, between the 16th and 17th of January, with a corresponding water level between 3.5 and 3.7 metres. So in terms of our forecasts, water has recently moved out of the Edward Wakul system and back into the, into the River Murray, into the main channel. So this is what will improve our confidence as the water starts to move through now. At this stage, the water levels further downstream of Renmark appear to be broadly within the range that we were anticipating. But these will be continue to be monitored as the peak moves through. And we'll regularly update the information and our predictions as it does. So this now takes me to the observations that we've seen this week um, and what we're doing about them. During the last week, we have observed that a significant amount of flow is bypassing river monitoring sites used for calculating the flow to South Australia at the border. Flood waters have now spread across much of the floodplain near the border, with flow also occurring through anna branches and across floodplain areas that are normally dry. This situation is extremely challenging for us to measure river flow. Flow going around river monitoring sites has also been observed at a number of other sites, both upstream um, of the border and within South Australia. The current observed flow and river level is also much higher than what it was previously gauged during field visits at many monitoring locations, or it has been almost 50 years since field measurements were made at this flow. We advise that at these current flood levels, river Murray flow estimates should be interpreted with a high degree of caution. For example, recent field gaugings at, a, at Wentworth demonstrated that the flow being reported for that site was being significantly overestimated, which is why flow reporting from that site has now been suspended by the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. This has occurred at a number of gauges throughout the system. Monitoring sites considered to be of higher reliability and what we'll be relying more on um, are those at Wakul Junction and Euston, noting that they there may still be um, a small amount of error at these sites given the very high flows. In addition, changes to the river channel and floodplain, which have occurred since the 1970s, including things like levees and roads, um, changes in the, in the river's um, natural characteristics, uh, vegetation and things like that, are also believed to be accounting for some local increases in observed water levels compared to historic floods. So for example, where there may have been flooding in 1974, they might not be now or there may be more. Flow forecasts provided by the Department for Environment and Water, which are developed in consultation with the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, Bureau of Meteorology and other upstream water management agencies, have been measured against the total River Murray flow crossing at the South Australian border. As flow and water levels have increased near the border in recent weeks, the difference between the forecast and calculated flow to South Australia has increased, which is now understood to be caused by an increasing amount of flow bypassing the river monitoring site and the topographic changes. In demonstration of this, river levels at Renmark have now exceeded levels observed during the 1974 flood. 
despite the recorded flow to South Australia being approximately 20 gigalitres a day less than what was recorded in 1974. Consequently, the daily calculated flow to South Australia is no longer considered to be a useful measure in relation to the forecast flow and water levels. In response to this, hydrographers are now currently visiting a number of sites to undertake manual field gauge readings of flow and water level. And as we receive their advice, we'll continue to communicate that in our flow reports and through the SES. It's really important to note that this does not by any means affect the predicted peak flow and water levels at all that will be coming to South Australia. So once again, water levels near the South Australian border are currently very similar to the 1974 flood levels, and the total flow is estimated to be at about 100 gigalitres a day. It is forecast that the total flow at the South Australian border will reach a peak in the range of 190 to 220 gigalitres a day in the last week of December. I'd also really just like to talk to you very quickly about black water, um, just because SA water isn't here today, um, and we just need to be aware of it. So at the moment, um, we've been advised that there are no black water events that have been detected in South Australia, um, although they are starting to be seen upstream and, and reported on over the border. It's really important um, that you know, the black water, you know, is treated with caution, you know, you don't directly drink from the river or swim in it or do anything like that in it. Um, and SA Water has provides, provided some pamphlets at the back um, about black water and their treatment and um, for drinking water and things like that. But it does happen um, and it does have negative impacts, especially for our environment. Small levels of black water are, are okay um, and uh, fish can deal with it, but when there are high levels of organic matter added to waterways, this is when the water starts to deoxygenate um, and it's that we start to see fish kills and things like that. Um, so it's really important just to be aware um, and you know continue to monitor the situation around you um, in the event that black water does occur near you. That's all from me. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Next, we've got Ben from the Mid Murray Council. Thank you, thank you Fiona, and uh, thank you for coming along today. Um, one of the key messages is about being informed and making sure you've got the appropriate information to make good decisions. Um, noting that uh, we had a community meeting in Blanchetown five weeks ago, um, obviously it's not too far, and we've live streamed all of these. So the SES have to make strategic decisions about where they can locate these meetings. So um, I think there's been about 13 or 14 of these meetings across the Riverland and the Murraylands, um, and we've live streamed all of them to make sure, including holding one in Adelaide as well, to make sure people are informed and getting the right information. Uh, just your point about internet, um, so we print off and have the, uh, all of the information accessible at the council office. Um, so if you do need to get information, whether it's our flow reports or our high river updates, then those are all printed off and available in hard copy um, at the council office, which is over there. Yeah, look, we, obviously we've got to do what we can do. Okay, we're trying to make sure we um, do the best we can and keep people informed um, as well as we possibly can. And I think one of the key things is that whether it's local government or all the agencies, uh, the SES is the lead agency, but we're all working collaboratively and collegially to try to, to support the community as best we can under really challenging circumstances. So as I mentioned, the SES are the lead agency, um, and uh, we've been working with them as part of the zone emergency support team since I think uh, September or August, um, as mentioned. Um, council, from our perspective, have a critical incident management team um, that's been uh, employed or um, operated, sorry, it's been um, uh, commenced uh, to manage the operations of our response to the flood. Um, our focus has been on preparedness, um, looking at all of our assets and uh, doing risk mitigation strategies, with the key focus being the safety of people um, and then obviously infrastructure and assets so, uh, as long as that as well. Although we've been focusing on preparedness, um, we are also thinking about recovery. Um, this is not a flash flood, as you can fully appreciate. Um, and so we need to not only be prepared now, but we need to be looking at what's going to happen um, you know, in uh, it's four, six, eight weeks' time to make sure that we can recover. Uh, we have recovery action plans, and we're working, the state has appointed uh, a state uh, recovery coordinator, Alex Zimmerman, 
um, and he's getting around to all of the communities to make sure that we're prepared um, for what happens in the coming months. Uh, we've got, as I said, uh, looking at all of our assets, uh, our swims, um, community waste management systems or STED systems. Um, sometimes we have to make decisions to turn them off because the power's gone off, um, or sometimes we've had to do it because of inundation. Um, we try to give up as much notice to the community as possible. Uh, we uh, produce a high river update uh, every Friday. We're actually doing it twice a week at the moment, um, and that's got all of the information from a local perspective. The sa.gov.au website has been mentioned. Um, that is the source of all information, uh, but our website which is a, a dedicated page, has local information around road closures. Um, we use a traffic light system. We would love to give as much notice as possible, but sometimes we have to make decisions quickly because of uh, inundation. Um, but we have red, uh, amber and green uh, traffic light signal on our road closures, and all of that information is included on those uh, weekly uh, e-newsletters, um, which we print off and have in our council offices as, as well. So making sure that we've got uh, the information to inform the community. Uh, as we mentioned, we are building um, some temporary levies. Uh, we're doing, building a temporary levy here uh, around the caravan park and some in Manham. Um, and uh, we're also working with uh, the other agencies, uh, other flood mitigation strategies, whether it be sandbags or defence cells, um, depending on the asset uh, and depending on the ability to implement those. Uh, we're having to close marine structures, um, including the Morgan boat ramp, which is closed. People are still using that. They uh, will have to use that at their own risk. Um, that is a construction site down there. Um, there are cars and trucks um, and plant and equipment uh, going uh, six days a week. So if you are going to use those... Um, do you need a hand, mate? Keep going. So we keep the... Uh, keep the locals uh, engaged. Um, so yeah, you, if you are going to use the river which has been mentioned, you've got to use it safely and it's at your own risk. Um, there are submerged infrastructure um, and floating debris um, throughout the river, so please make sure you're, you're doing it safely. Uh, from a community perspective, we've been working with the SES on the community sandbagging sites. I think we've um, transported uh, over 4,000 tonne of sand across the Mid-Murray Council area. Um, so we, and we continue to supply that uh, for those people. And noting that uh, obviously there's been inundation uh, up this way uh, in the, the shack areas, whether it was Beaumont's across the river where we have people, um, or the three shack settlements to downriver from here uh, for a number of number of weeks. So um, the, the flows have uh, been impacting people for a long period of time. Uh, displaced residents, we've been working with Housing SA. Uh, we've opened up some camping sites. They don't have facilities, one being here uh, at the sporting complex uh, for those people that do want to stay uh, near their uh, places of uh, residence, if that's what they want to do, whether they uh, want to put, um, stay in their caravan or other facilities. Um, so we've been working with Housing SA to assist those vulnerable people. Um, something that's been uh, raised throughout these discussions is around development applications and if you want to do work, noting that some of you have already done work, um, if you are building a structure that's over three metres and it's a temporary levy, um, you do need development approval. Uh, what we've said under the plans that we have available through the um, Planning Act is that you can do that without applying for the development, uh, development application. You have to apply for it retrospectively. So we understand that if emergency works need to uh, occur to protect assets or people, then you need to get on to do that. It's only deemed to be work if it's over three metres. Um, but if you are going to do that, um, I encourage you to speak to our planning staff to make sure that you are um, doing it properly and also considering your neighbours because just because you build it around your house, what happens to the flow? Um, we've seen a number of issues with uh, levy banks that have been built. Um, it's important that you get advice on that and you use the right materials because, um, as my 10-year-old tells me, he knows what happens when you build a sandcastle and the, and the waves come in. Um, it just washes away. So making sure that you are using the right material. The other thing we're looking at doing, obviously, is going to be a, a significant impact to uh, property um, in the recovery about streamlining our um, development process to ensure that those people that need assistance and want to rebuild or need to um, fix stuff that's been damaged because of the water, they can do that in a really fast uh, way. Um, so we're planning and our, our, our planning department uh, are putting things in place to allow those people to, to do it and be prioritised, I suppose, versus someone that might be building their shed in Truro. Um, 
Financial support, so Council had a workshop at their first meeting to consider uh, what support Council could do to provide uh, ratepayers. Um, I will say that the, the State Government um, are the ones that provide financial support um, and they've got grants and I encourage you to go to the relief centres or speak to um, those relevant agencies about what uh, grants are available to support people, whether it's business or personal. Um, but we're considering what we do with our rates and our fees and services. Obviously, we charge for waste, um, and so Council are considering what we can do in that space if um, we aren't providing that service. Um, we have a meeting in December and some decisions we made there. Um, as I started, communication is really important, making sure you've got the right information. We've got a de dedicated web page and we've got that High River update that I encourage you to sign up for with that we distribute twice a week. And as I said, that is available at our council offices for those that may not have power or internet capabilities. Um, just a couple of local issues. Well, one, sorry, waste first. Um, we've been working with Solo, who's our waste contractor. Um, they believe they can still provide all the services uh, across the district, um, given the ferry closures that have occurred. Um, they're putting extra trucks and resources around to do that. Um, they may not be able to obviously access all of the um, sites, whether it's a shack association because the road's been closed. Um, so those people that are still um, either living in areas that there is an inundation, um, what we say is if you take the bin to the uh, closest point or you leave the bin at the closest point that the truck can access, um, they're doing everything they can to continue those services as best they can throughout the, um, the flood event. Um, the Morgan Wharf has been closed um, for safety and WHS issues, um, so please do not moor against that if you are thinking that, if you're a houseboat um, owner or operator, because um, uh, there's some structural issues that we are making sure that we're looking into to uh, protect the um, safety of the public. And, and I've mentioned the Morgan boat ramp. Um, so that's all. I'm happy to answer any questions after um, with another staff member from Council here, Russell, who can uh, assist with from a roads uh, perspective. We are working um, as well as we can with all of the agencies to, to support the community during this uh, really challenging time. So uh, my last message is uh, stay safe and look after those that may not be able to look after themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, Tony from Infrastructure and Transport. Thanks, Tony. Hello. So my name is Tony Scarlett and I'm from the Department for Infrastructure and Transport and I'm based out at Murray Bridge. So I'll be giving you a brief overview today of uh, this, the impacts of this event to ferries, marine safety and state roads today. I do have an information and flyer available over on the table and it lists all the web pages and phone numbers that I might mention in this presentation so you don't have to write them all down. Um, do I, so I do encourage you to pick that up while you're here and you can take some for other people that might not have been able to get, come to this um, day today. Um, so our department's been involved in preparing and planning for this event since August with a lot of the other agencies that are here today um, and we've been um, trying to identify any marine or road issues that might occur during this flooding event. We've carefully considered what roads uh, might need to close due to inundation um, uh, based on the flooding maps that came out and we've done uh, work on planning out detours for all of those closures and those are available on our website so that people can look and plan um, ahead of time for when those roads do close. Um, a couple of the roads that have already closed is um, Book Penong Road between Loxton and Berry. Um, that closed just probably two weeks ago now. Um, and we did try to keep it open as long as possible um, and usually the first step is closing it to heavy vehicles so that we can maintain um, the pavement um, at a safe uh, standard so that light vehicles can use it for longer. Um, but it is a very fine balance between keeping it open and keeping it safe and then giving people enough notice that we're going to close it. So um, that's about the water coming up to the road but it's also about making sure the pavement is still safe and doesn't get to a state where we're going to have to do major fixing at the other end because you also don't want the road staying closed for a long time once the water recedes. So it's a really fine ballast that we're working with. Um, we've also got Morgan Road near Barmara um, is closed and that's to support the works that the Berry Barmara Council are doing for a levy alongside the Lake Bonnie. <coughs> 
Um, Kingston Road um, is closed to heavy vehicles at the moment um, and that's likely to close in the next week or so um, as the water's starting to come up to the side um, of that one as well. Again, our detours are listed on our website. Um, so you can see where, once that closes, where you need to go. Um, Wakery, there's a small section of uh, Taylorville Road, which is near the ferry landing. Um, so that road is going to need to, that little section needs to be closed. And the detour to get on the ferry um, will be a bit of a longer track. So, but we will mean we can leave the ferry open for longer because we know that's quite an um, important piece of infrastructure in the area. <coughs> we'll be continuing to monitor all the other roads and we'll install traffic controls or close roads when needed. But like I said, we'll try to communicate these changes to everyone um, through our social media and our websites um, as quickly as possible. All the current road closures, including council roads, um, are listed on the Traffic SA website, um, which you can get on your phone um, and check at any time if a road is closed. It only lists the current road closures, not the ones that are pending. So keep an eye on that one. And please remember it's not safe to drive into floodwaters at any time. And if members of the public come across any dangers on the road at all, including floodwaters, they can be reported 24-7 to the Traffic Management Centre on 1800 018 313. Um, with the ferries, we're also closely monitoring those. And we're already seeing um, uh, quite a few that need to be closed, such as the Morgan Ferry recently, um, but also Lirup Swan Reach um, and Manum, uh, the second Manum Ferry will close tomorrow night. Um, the Pernong Ferry is likely to need to close in the coming week or so as well, as the water keeps rising over the highest, land, the highest landing point. In some cases, some of our ferries will need to close because the, water, the road leading to the ferry landing is inundated with water. So while the ferry could still operate, you can't get on or off. So um, that's um, one of the um, finicky bits about a ferry. The road that leads to them by necessity has to go low. So that's a risk for a couple of our ferries. But at this point, Walker Flat, Cadell, Narung, Wellington and Taylor Bend are all open at this stage. Now, some of you might have seen the recent vessel restrictions on the River Murray, which have been in place since the 23rd of November, advising a four knot speed limit, um, which is commonly referred to as a fast walking speed. Um, for any vessels operating within 250 metres of a partially or fully submerged dwelling um, or building, um, and also to within 250 metres of any levee partially or fully submerged. Um, and the four knot speed limit also applies to vessels travelling at night or in restricted visibility. Um, also, all personal watercraft, um, like jet skis, must also not ex exceed four knots on any part of the River Murray. And there's also to be um, no swimming, bathing, diving within 250 metres of a local weir, um, and also no use of um, personal, um, not human powered. Um, vessels such as canoes and kayaks, surf skis, that sort of thing. The uh, vessel operators on vessels 12 metres and under are required to ensure all passengers on board wear a level 50 or above life jacket while underway or at an anchor. We know there's getting less and less vessels on the river as there's a lot less places to actually get on the water, um, but there are still people out there, so these are to keep everyone safe. Um, these restrictions apply from the South Australian border down to the ferry landings at Wellington. And the marine safety team um, ask everyone to take care on or near the water and watch out for hazards on the water. So our marine safety team are in the area at the moment um, and they're staying up here during this event. Um, they're working really hard to mark out any hazards in the water with yellow buoys. Um, and you, uh, there's also signage on the river banks to say that there are hazards in the water. If there's any, um, any hazards you're aware of that aren't already marked, you can report them to us. It's via an online form. Um, and all you'd have to do is Google marine safety and it's the first search term that comes up through the Google search. 
Um, there are some things such as jetties and pontoons, um, even you know walkways and stuff now on the riverfronts that are all underwater, and they are quite a hazard because people don't necessarily expect them. Even some you know permapine posts and stuff that would have marked out a, a section of things, they're all underwater now uh, and are a huge hazard to watercraft. Uh, under as of. The 1st of December, there's a new 50 metre exclusion zone around electricity power lines standing in the River Murray floodwaters. That's helped to he help keep communities safe and to avoid unnecessary disconnections. In general, we're recommending that all vessels stay away from the floodplain areas altogether where possible, and should entry to the area be required, vessel operators must observe the 50 metre exclusion zone around power lines and infrastructure. In summary, we're just asking the community to stay safe on our roads, on our ferries and on our waterways. If you see a danger on our roads, please call the Traffic Management Centre. If there's a hazard on the water, report it to our marine team. And we know that road closures and the ferry closures are inconvenient and disruptive and our department's top priority is to keep everyone safe. And I can assure you we'll be doing everything we can to reopen everything as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. We next have Barb from Primary Industries Region, South Australia. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Barb Cowie. I work for Primary Industry and Regions and I'm part of the Regions team. And just so you all know, I live 30 k's up the road and that little bit of Taylorville Road that's going to close is going to cost me 40 k's each way. So just to put it out there, I'm feeling the same amount of uh, pain as, um, well not quite as much because I'm actually living in a high level house so I'm lucky. Uh, but I am here and know what's going on. Um, so basically uh, Primary Industries and Regions is working across all, all of the other government uh, sectors as well. Um, as part of the Regions team, we're actually there to work with all our communities. Um, we report into uh, Primary Industries and uh, get advice from all of the other sectors there and also hope to be able to give that information back out. Um, look, and thank you also for coming. Uh, look. I'm going to start with our ongoing work because that doesn't change and as you would all know also in the room we currently have 16 fruit fly outbreaks in the Riverland that are, is, are causing a significant issue for our growers and our industry sectors. They are still number one on our priority list and we are working as best we can to maintain um, all access to our current traps and monitoring that we do. We also still have the same number of, well, we've got a, a huge team of uh, people working on that and we've actually relocated the majority of them from Loxton to the um, Riverland Field Day site so that they can actually access without with these road closures. We've also released uh, quite a few people for short periods of time to assist SES with the door knocking. So if someone in an orange suit with PERSA written on the back does knock on your door, ask them for their ID um, because they may be helping with the, the response, but they all should have an ID on them. We're also currently working on uh, monitoring Varroa, uh, the Varroa mite with uh, Apris, and uh, we also encourage everybody who, who lives in the region to have the Japanese encephalitis vaccination, which is free to everybody on the river corridor. Um, in our flood response, we're, as I've mentioned, we're part of the overall government response. Um, specifically, we have a responsibility in the animal welfare part and um, we uh, are responsible for uh, if there is any stranded animals, uh, we will be working to get them off if there's any, any animal welfare issues. That is also our area. We have a relationship with uh, RSPCA, so um, depending on the nature of what needs to happen, it might be a PERSA team or it might be an RSPCA team that come out to, to um, help in that situation. Uh, we are also responsible for 
uh, fish kills that may come from low water quality. And we um, have heard today that uh, blackwater events aren't in South Australia yet, but we do know that they have been upstream and we do know that there's been significant fish kills. We also understand that fish kills don't only happen from a blackwater event, but we do have in place ready to clean up any large scale fish kills that do happen. We have a team of people ready to go. We may not see them though because there's very few of us that are on the ground looking at that every day. So we would really appreciate if anyone sees any fish kills to ring our um, fish watch or um, I'm happy to give my card out um, just so that we can actually get people out as soon as possible. Um, we are also looking at water quality for stock and stock because that's obviously an issue moving forward um, as well. I just want to, um, it's the only safety reminder you're going to get from me, but please be mindful that there will be extra snakes um, coming up because of um, the high water and obviously water's encroaching on their ground. Uh, we've seen a few extras, uh, only as of this week. Um, but what I would say is uh, we've asked each of the councils to put the snake catchers, if appropriate, on the website if it's in town. So please be mindful of that. We also have our farm and business mentors in place. And what you're hearing is a lot of numbers, a lot of information, and um, a lot of places to go that will all merge into one. Our farm and business mentors are there to actually help people uh, when when a situation like this emerges and they will come out, they'll confidentially talk to people one-on-one -on -one and actually help navigate all of this information. Um, all of their numbers, once again, unfortunately, are on a website. We're getting more brochures printed and once they are, I'll make sure that they're in the general store and the... Um, and the council officers, but I'll also make sure they're over at the Cadell General Store for those people on the other side of the river. Um, we also are part of the re relief centres, uh, currently also mentioned in Berry and in Morgan and soon to be um, uh, Murray Bridge. Uh, we, ha we have a primary industries uh, grant that we're taking expressions of interest for and there will be someone in the relief centres to help uh, people fill that out. We're also working with the Department of um, uh, Small and Family Business, the flies are up the back. Um, they actually have the generator grants and they also have the small bus business closure grants. Um, they are also in the relief centres and they will also um, talk to you about our, our grants as well. Um, other than that, I really don't have a lot else, but I'm happy to take any questions later on as well. Thanks, Barb. The South Australian um, Housing Authority and an apology for today, so I've got some a statement to read from them. From. So the South Australian Housing Authority are the functional services activated in a disaster by the lead agency. In this case, SES has activated housing to perform the relief function. Relief provides physical, financial and emotional support to impacted people in a disaster. There's two centres that are currently open. There's one in Berry at the Senior Citizens Club, Crawford Terrace, and one in Manham at the Football Club. Both centres are open from 9am to 5pm, seven days a week. In the centre are not only housing staff, there are also other participating agencies. So there's Red Cross for welcoming and psychosocial support, Centrelink for financial assistance, and that's particularly for those who can't attend their workplace, DIIS for generator and small business grants, disaster ministries for care and support, legal services and PERSA for their grant and animal welfare. Relief staff also process personal hardship grants, accommodation grants, both long term and short term and rental assistance grants. The basic eligibility for these grants is on the sa.gov.au website or call the relief hotline and talk to someone about your eligibility or pop into a relief centre. The centre can also assist people who have to leave their primary residence and have no other options with motel type accommodation. We will try our best to place people near community, but there's a lack of available accommodation, so you may not be near your home. Even if you're not impacted by the flood at your home, please feel free to attend the centre or call the hotline to get access to psychosocial support, which can be by phone or in person. 
It's normal to feel stressed in these situations and good to talk to people, so please reach out. The relief information number is 1800 302 787. The next speaker we have is Paul from South Australian Power Networks. Thanks, Paul. Hello, my name is Paul Irwin from SA Power Networks. Um, I know there's a number of you that we've spoken to already in this room that have been impacted over, well, certainly yesterday, uh, and have uh, faced a, a disconnection. Um, let me say probably from the outset, outset, it's our absolute priority to try and leave the supply on to as many people as we possibly can that are going to be impacted by this event. To that end, we have been undertaking individual disconnections of properties up and down the river so far where we can gain access to do that. So to give you some sort of idea, there's been roughly 1,800 properties up to the end of last week that we've been able to go in, isolate that individual property, that individual business, so that other people upstream of that same network aren't impacted. Our ability to continue doing that is going to be tested as waters continue to come up and beat us in some cases to some of those. So there will be larger disconnections that potentially occur impacting more people. And sometimes that water doesn't need to be at your front door for it to, to impact you. There's two times that we'll disconnect. One of those is when you're going to be inundated with flood water. I think all of you that certainly live here would know if you're in Brenda Park or somewhere down around there, here you're, you're inundated with water that would be a disconnection. There were some disconnections that occurred yesterday um, where people don't have water at their front door and don't understand why they've gone off. And those disconnections occur when our infrastructure and the water level get too close together. The, the poles and wires that you see up and down the street are at a height for a certain reason and they're to avoid electric shock uh, to people. And when you start reducing the height distances between those two, then you start increasing the possibility of electrical shock. The issue that we have is that Everybody in this room knows that. I'm 100% sure of that. It's the one person that doesn't know that or doesn't recognise that or the kids that want to go out in a tinny somewhere because they, they're on school holidays and they think it would be fun to go up and, and check things out because they've never seen this event before. They're the people that we need to cater for. Um, we, like everybody else, have been planning for uh, a period of time, um, looking at the, the flow rates come up, go down, come up, go down, and you, you do your best to try and manage at those. Obviously, if you're in a low-lying region, and that shack area is certainly in, in risk of disconnection. Probably the only good news that's really come out is the Department of Infrastructure and Transport that have talked about the 50 metre exclusion zone around electrical infrastructure. That, in turn, has had the I'll use this term, the Office of the Technical Regulator, so the people that make the rules about the distances between water level and lines, they've been able to reduce the safe distance um, that we would need to disconnect people off of. So it's given us more opportunity to leave more people on, but there will come to a point if water levels continue to rise that those levels will be breached and we'd need to turn supply off to some areas for community safety. Uh, it goes without saying that when it comes to recovery, the restoration of supply we think will be far more challenging than the disconnection of supply. Um, we've got roads that may be washed away. You might have huge amounts of debris on roads, making them almost impassable. Um, in the earlier days of this, we did a lot of... Uh, work on our network to cut in what we call cut in breaks. Um, so you're basically, you know, cutting parts of lines to isolate individual properties that will all need to be rectified. That takes longer time to rectify than what it does to simply take people off. Um, where we can, we'd like to provide as much notice as possible uh, to people. Um, I appreciate for those of you that we've had a chance to, to talk to before the meeting started, that hasn't always been the case. It's not a perfect system, but it's the best that we've got. Uh, there's a flyer at the rear of the hall that I'd encourage you to pick up. Um, there's QR codes on the bottom of that, that flyer, one that shows you how to sign up for an SMS service. Um, we primarily will try and talk to people through that SMS service on a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, if you're not familiar with QR codes, I'm, I'm certainly not. There's also a number on the bottom there, 131261. Just call that number, people will take you through what you need to do to sign up to, to that service. Um, 
All of our maps that we have here uh, as a business are two-dimensional. They're two-dimensional maps that we work off of. So when it comes to disconnections, crews actually come out to the site in, in essence to look at the topography of the land there to say actually do we think you're going to be inundated by water or not? Is that infrastructure going to be impacted by water or not? And then they make an assessment on site. In doing that over the last week we've actually conducted less disconnections than we ideally thought we would have to do uh, during that time. Uh, and that will continue as the weeks unfold. Um, Plus we've got a lot of extra personnel in this area as well. So you've got people that their primary place of residence isn't in the Riverland. They come from either the Adelaide Hills or other regional areas or Partry metropolitan areas. So they're not familiar with the landscape here. Um, as things happen for us as well, we'll find some difficulties getting around this area. Um, so that may mean if you have an unplanned interruption, um, it's going to take us longer to go from location to location. As roads are cut off and they impact folks here, we'll, we'll face the same sort of issues. So it's worth identifying that that's the, the case. If we do disconnect your property, we will let the retailer that sends you a bill know that we've disconnected the property. This stops a bill coming out to you for the period that you're not using energy at your home. So there's no supply charge, there's no usage charges, there's no estimate that's coming out to We thought that was a prudent thing to do, um, to say to retailers, don't bill people, they're going through enough hardship as it is. When you do have your supply restored, again we'll let the retailer know that your supply has come back on and we'd encourage you at that time to, to speak to the to speak to the retailer. I take the point that the folks over here were talking about about uh, internet and SMS and lack of ability to achieve some of those things. Um, we've certainly set up and we are setting up uh, next week and the week after uh, in all of the, the major towns here uh, a presence. So Tuesday the 20th of December will be located at the Morgan Activity Centre uh, in 3rd Street um, and we'll be there primarily from around 10ish to 3ish in the afternoon. As you heard from other speakers, it's hard to get accommodation obviously here and we don't want to take up accommodation that somebody that's been displaced from their home could actually have. So it's not a responsible thing to do. So we'll be day making day trips up and down through these areas. We'll then leave the area um, for a period of time until the waters start to abate and we'll work with Department of Energy and Water uh, to Environment and Water to understand when that is. And then we'll have the same people back in the same locations and we'll try and distribute those dates certainly through the, the local council. But we ask you as members of the community to share those dates with people that you know, uh, anyone else that you know that they can come and talk to us about the reconnection effort and what they've got to do as far as a reconnection is, is concerned. Um, we haven't published on our website areas that have been disconnected. Um, and we've done that for a reason. Um, we've learnt from the floods interstate that there was a degree of looting occurring to properties up and down the river. Uh, so we didn't want to lay out a blueprint for anybody that was thinking in an unscrupulous way to come into people's properties to actually try and look to, to pill for something. Unlike a planned or unplanned interruption that, that you might have here. So if you, if you had a storm and the power went out for a period of time, you're not going to leave your home. You're going, to, you're going to stay here. In this event, people might be displaced for weeks or, or months, which means you won't be at your property for that period of time. So um, we've made an effort to try and communicate through this SMS or come and see us when we're located here in, in Morgan. Um, as far as safety is concerned, um, and I, I get the point here from the ladies that were talking over here, if you've been, if your property isn't flooded net yet, but you think at the estimated levels of up to 220 gigalitres, it is, it is going to be impacted. We ask you to make your place electrically safe now. Um, so it goes without saying, everybody's been saying, switch off any item and, and lift it up high or remove it from the, the property if you can. Um, if you've got a solar system and you think it's going to be impacted um, by water levels, we ask you to turn that off. And if you don't know how to do that, just call us on the 13 12 61 number at the bottom of this fly and we'll take you through what you've got to do. You've paid a lot of money for these systems. You want them to be working when you when you head back out and, and, and look to recover. We also ask you to turn the main electrical switch off at your, your switchboard. When you do come back um, to, the, to the property itself, 
if your property's been inundated with water at the lower levels, like in the building here, you can see um, general power outlets at a lower level, like your skirting board level and, and surrounds. We recommend you get an electrician in just to give you uh, a tick of safety, that everything's okay to move back in. If it actually hits your main switchboard where your meters are, you will need to get an electrical certificate of compliance from a registered electrician that they can sign off that it's safe for you to move back into your home. If you do go back into your home after you've done all of those things and you find that you have uh, some tingling, a tingling sensation in your taps, uh, in your kitchen or in your bathroom, you need to call us immediately. That, indicates that there's still a problem at your property that the electrician might not have picked up. We'll come out, rectify it if we can. If it's inside your home, we'll be uh, advising you to get an electrician in to, to come and do that. That's an important one. Um, as has been um, suggested here, if you're travelling by boats in floodwaters, if you come across a power line, don't ever expect that it is necessarily a dead power line. Always think that they're live. There's a lot of live power lines running through the floodplains at the moment where we've been able to keep supply live and supply to people. We have been doing that. So it, I know that possibly sounds confusing because some people here have been disconnected already, but we're saying to people, don't ever think that they are necessarily dead just because you've been disconnected. Um, probably the, the more specific thing um, that I'd look for you to do is try and register for that SMS and talk to your neighbours. If you're aware of businesses or if you are a business that's going to be impacted, um, there's things that you can do to try and avoid being disconnected as part of the flood. We'd encourage you to contact us. We can put you in touch with one of our project officers. We've got a, a large volume of them up here trying to help people through that, that process. The last thing we want to do is impact the economic prosperity of the community here and people whose livelihoods depend on some of the primary producers and, and growers. So where possible, we're looking to help as many people as you, as you possibly can. Um, my compatriot at the back, Cam Daniel, who's wearing a shirt like this, has maps of our infrastructure and overlaid with the flooding that will occur, modelling from the 160 gigalitres all the way up to that 220 gigalitre mark that's been talked about here today. If you want to see what potential impact that will be on your property, we'd encourage you to come and see us afterwards and we can take you through how that impacts your individual, your individual place. SA Water apologises that they were unable to send a spokesperson to attend this forum, but please be assured that they have crews on the ground working to maintain normal water services where possible and protect infrastructure to prevent or reduce damage in the longer term. This includes a large contingent within the Morgan area who will continue to support the local community. There is currently no impact to the drinking water supply or quality for any SA Water Riverland or Murray Lands customers, with the utilities water treatment plants designed to manage a range of source water quality challenges. The Morgan Water Treatment Plant is currently not seen to be at risk of flood inundation due to its location away from the river. The treatment, this treatment plant also services the Morgan to Whaler pipeline, which supplies water to a large part of regional South Australia. SA Water continue to monitor quality and reliability of this supply and provide any relevant updates to the broader community as needed. SA Water is asking people to register their mobile phone number to be kept informed of important and timely notifications on how the River Murray flood could impact waste and wastewater services in the area. So to update your contact details to receive SMS notifications, you can visit sawater.com.au. Ian's just going to go over a couple of safety issues and then we'll open the forum for questions. Thank you. Thanks, Fiona. Everything that's been said here um, this morning is very important. However, I'm with the State Emergency Service and my role is to keep the community safe. And the way that I can do that is by giving out messaging. So just some final things, and it's been touched on with my other presenters here. Um, please keep up to date with those warnings um, and monitor those road closures. 
You don't necessarily, if even though we've got flooding, it is December, we're coming into fire season. If you need to evacuate because of a fire for any reason, you need to know about road closures. So please keep up to date with those. Um, and I can't believe I'm saying this in the same sentence, don't drive through floodwaters. So if you think that you can get through that road that's got water over it, probably not. All right, because it could turn into a fire from a fire risk to saving you a drowning risk. So please be aware of those road closures and do pre-planning. Um, mentioned before, be aware of the damp power lines. And if you, if you are going into the water, boat, swim, whatever, please, please stay within your capabilities. Um, be mindful of those waterborne diseases um, that was mentioned before, so the JV, the Ross River and the Murray River encephalitis. So please be aware of those. Um, consider the uh, suitability of drinking water. I mentioned before about generators, don't use them in confined spaces. And finally, do not play in flood water. You may think that it's nice and slow and it's not doing anything, but it's not clear water, it's very brown water. And because it's risen so far, you may not know what is underneath. We've already heard about benches being covered over that were normally very easy to sit on looking at the beautiful river. So please be aware, do not play in flood water and don't let your children play in flood water. Our responsibility is to keep our emergency service crews safe. So if you do need to call for assistance, please ensure that you do give any details of any hazards that you are aware of. And if it is a life threat, please call triple zero. If it's for any flood or storm response, then you can contact the SES on 132 500. Or if it's just for non-threatening uh, situations, if it's not urgent, you can go to that ses.sa.gov.au website. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. What we'll do, we'll open the, the forum for questions. We'll have someone taking the microphone around. Can we please ask that you put up your hand, stand, and one question at a time, please, and we'll bring the microphone back for the speakers. Uh, so if someone, the gentleman down here in the middle, I'll just, before you do it, I'll just get the microphone down to you so we can hear you, and it's also for the benefit of the people on the live stream. Thank you. Um, my question would be more to, to Tony. I live here in the town, but um, also the general manager over here at Cadell Trading Centre. So it, it could possibly impact up to a dozen people. I'm also a volunteer in the town with the ambulance service. Now, I'm hearing strong rumours through the week that the causeway at Cadell is a strong chance that that may not get inundated, but it may get eroded and closed. Is there any truth on that rumour? So the causeway meaning Morgan Cadell Road? <laughs> yep, yep. I, there's that section where the, uh, um, the causeway is, that's already closed, I believe. So that's a council road. Oh, okay. Right, so, yep, I was thinking up the other end. Okay. Um, just today, um, the lady here was telling me there's water on the road up closer up the Cadell end. So we've reported that to council, because that, that road's a council road. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. Yep. Because that that would be a council road. I need to check exactly. Yep. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I don't know them all off the top of my head. We've got many. Uh, with Department for Infrastructure and Transport, DIT. 
<laughs> but we answer to we answer to everything. Dipti, de, yeah, all sorts of things. <laughs> High waste department, everything. We've got another question out there. Hi, my question's to Tony again. Um, so far, we're totally inundated, but the number of people that are getting on the river with jet skis and they are literally not able to turn them over. They're literally playing in the water and the, the people that are on normal boats are having to rescue them before they smash into the cliffs. Is there a possibility that jet skis are banned on the river while this is in Hyde River? We're certainly conscious of the fact that there is a need for people to access the river. Um, so we, we don't want to ban things unless there's a safety issue. So um, that's not on the cards at the moment, but in, if there's cases where people are being reckless and being dangerous, that does need to be reported either to Marine Safety or SAPOL, who are the people that can actually enforce issues. Um, but if there is a danger, um, we would certainly look at doing banning of activities if it's causing issues. But the jet skis are supposed to be maintaining a four knot limit, but you're saying that it's, are you saying they're not doing it? No, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. You can report that to SAPOL, and because SAPOL can actually investigate that. Okay. More questions? I noticed the other day with your road closures um, that um, they consisted of a row of concrete blocks, bunting, and everything like that, straight across a bitumen road in a 100 kilometre an hour speed limit road. Um, the Department of Transport, whatever they're called now, and also the federal government, all the infrastructure on roads was put in with shear points. So if anything, if they hit anything, um, they collapsed rather than did any damage and all their uh, white post infrastructure went to plastic type things. So there was minimal damage. <laughs> I couldn't believe it when I seen all these concrete posts right across the road. Uh, you know, I can imagine the lawsuit that had happened uh, if somebody hit them, and that's not the only one. There's quite a few others in low traffic areas, but this one here was actually in a 100k limit. Okay, yeah, the, the barriers are actually what, sorry? No, I know. Hmm. Yeah, those, those barriers, those, the, the orange barriers you're talking about? No, they're not red bunting. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Some of our road closures, we've got those orange barriers. They're water filled, so if someone actually hit them, it's not such a bad thing. Okay. Is that a council thing or? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. So, yep, that's a yep council signage that one. But a lot of our um, we we haven't got the resources to put lights on everything. Unfortunately, we we're going to have a lot of road closures. Um, well, there should be. Um, the, most of the road closures we're doing, we've got speed signage slowing down and advanced warning saying road closed. No, okay. Well, that's something we need to fix then. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. 
I went yesterday to the lock number one, and I was very surprised that all the planks are still in to the top. Why the, what, what's the reason for it? Why they don't take more out and let it, the water run down? It's not much water going over lock one. I can show you some photo, it's, it's ridiculous, I think. But what's the reason for it? Why they keep the water back? To, to get us drowned up here and to keep the bottom ha happy or what? I don't know. Um, that's a very good question, um, and that's definitely a question for SA Water. Um, they operate all of the locks on behalf of the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, so I can definitely take that on notice and, um, and answer it. Have we got any more questions? Um, mine was more of a, a statement, I guess, than a question. Um, was just to say, you've mentioned about the flood relief centres. Um, we visited the one at Berry a few days ago, and it was fantastic. It was a great experience. They were very helpful. Um, the volunteers and the personnel from the various government departments um, gave us plenty of information. There was booklets that we could pick up to sort of take away and, um, and get more information from. Um, they even fed us, so they were just fabulous. Um, so I'd just like to say, if anyone's thinking about it, definitely worthwhile going there. You'll get lots of very good information. Um, we were entitled to a grant. Um, we didn't have to jump through hoops. Um, they just verified the information, and the money was in our account the next day. So overall, that was a really good experience. So well done there. Thank you. Yeah, mine's uh, just for this gentleman. Um, may I suggest that uh, you tell people uh, to take a photograph of their switchboards if, if it's likely that their switchboards are going under? Um, once you've taken a photograph of your switchboard, once the water goes down, all you need to do is send that, to, that photograph to your electrician and he can get all the appropriate uh, uh, bits and pieces that he needs to uh, rectify your switchboard. It's a great idea, thank you. And it's good things that we're learning up and down the river here as well. And one thing I wanted to say to people, if your switchboard isn't inundated and your electrician comes out and the meter is destroyed as a result of it, um, we as a business for residential homes will just be bypassing that meter, which doesn't mean you get free electricity. It just means that the energy keeps flowing to your house, so you keep using everything in your house. The retail will probably send you an estimated bill and the metering and the red tape stuff can just catch up later um, with it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we were just wondering about the relief centre at Berry. Are we still going to be able to get there with the road closures and things? Is there a map there to show us where the detours will be? Yep, um, there certainly are maps online. Um, Traffic SA, yeah. <laughs> if you want to come and see me after, um, I can show you on my phone exactly where you can go. Um, the only road closures, I think, um, if you're taking the highways and stuff, you'll be fine. Um, there's no closures of any of the highways, so that'll be fine. It's the, the ferries and stuff. Um, Cadell's still open, uh, Wakery's still open. So um, if that helps you navigate your way to Berry from there. Um, yeah, the, the, it's only Morgan Road which goes between the two highways that's shut between here and there. So that helps a bit. You can see me after and I can, we can work on, a, on my phone. Okay. Thank you. We're out of time. So a couple of things I just wanted to remind people of. Um, there's an emergency brochure which has all agency phone numbers, which is at the back of, of the room. So for people who don't have phones, it's, uh, sorry, don't have internet, it's useful to take that number. Um, 
There's also some white sheets at the back there with post-it notes. So if there's any questions that you think of that haven't been answered tonight, please write them down and we're taking them back, back to the relevant agencies. Um, We'd like to remind you to think about your mental health to also, we've talked about lots of other physical things, but speak to your GP or if you're feeling anxious or concerned about anything that's happening. A reminder, there's a lot of information here that you can take away with you. Take it away for friends, family, people who couldn't attend tonight. And also the event, is, as I said earlier, is on the SASES website. It will be on there later today and all events have been on that website. Thank you very much for coming out today. It's important for us to let, to let you know um, about what the information is and, and thank you for doing the right thing and getting in the information and wanting to keep your actions to take actions to keep yourself safe. And thank you very much. Uh, well, there'll be, there'll be, sorry, there'll be some, thank you. We, the presenters are here, tonight, are here today and they'll be available for 15 minutes or so. So if you've got something around your individual circumstances you'd like to talk about or something you've thought of, they'll be here while we're packing up. We've got um, SAPO here, we've got SAS also in attendance. So thank you to all of the speakers. The speakers, I'll just go through them again. So today we had Ian from the SES, we had Joe from Dew, Ben from the Council, Tony from DIT, Bob from Persa and Paul from SA Power Networks. So thank you to everyone.